Good morning! This is April at the Resellers Learning Curve and I want to thank everyone. Thank you all who are taking the time to watch this video and a very very special thank you because this is the second video in a series that I'm doing, an educational series, um, which actually requires some amount of work on my part. So I want to thank you for spending what is your hard earned money to purchase this video. As long as I possibly can, I want to keep these videos at a very minimal cost. I never, I don't want to go up on the price necessarily. However, um, I don't want to produce them super often either because I don't want anyone to get the impression that I'm creating content for monetary gain because that's not really the way that I operate. However, videos that require me to do a good amount of research, um, unfortunately, I just, I do have to charge for those because I'm not a person with idle time. <laughs> There's... There are definitely things that I need to be doing right now that I should be doing that I'm not doing. So as such, I wanna thank you for spending your hard earned money to purchase Reseller Research Methods 101. Really quick funny story, I started recording this video a couple of days ago. I wanna say it was Wednesday going into Thursday. I did not go to sleep on Wednesday night. I stayed up, I worked through the night. I got a lot of things done not as much as I would have liked, but I got a lot of things done. And so at about 5.30, 5.30 in the morning, I decided to start recording the video and it was going pretty well, not spectacular, but pretty well. The reason I say not spectacular is because um, it was a little bit rambly, but I was getting through the video and then my alarm clock went off because I had my alarm clock set for 6 or 6.30, 5.30, I don't know, but I, my alarm clock went off, my phone started vibrating, it fell to the floor, and that was the end of that video. So, since I had 40 minutes into it, I considered trying to splice them together, together and do some editing, but that's not really something I'm good at, nor is it something that I wanna just take the time to learn at this stage of my life. So instead of editing, I'm actually starting over. I have like a, a hair that's like driving me crazy. Where is it? Where is that crazy? Right there. Yeah, that thing is like driving me crazy. So um, once again, welcome to Reseller Research Methods 101. I thought the most obvious place for us to start in this discussion would be to break down what is research because yes, you hear people talk about research all the time, how you should do it, why you should do it, and yada, yada, yada. However, rarely do you hear people get into the nitty gritty of what research is and what it's all about. So before I do that, I want to start by saying, um, what are my qualifications for even talking about the subject matter? Well. For those of you who don't know, um, I'm a reseller. I love reselling. I don't think there's a time, I don't foresee a time in my life where I won't be a reseller to some extent. However, I'm also at my core an academic. I am. I just, I am. I love all things academic. I love all things academia. Well, not all things academia because it shouldn't cost so much, but I love academia um, if you didn't know, I work at a university. This has always been something of a um, of a passion of mine. This isn't even the first university that I've worked at, to be honest, because I just enjoy being in intellectual environments. And I find that colleges and universities are great places to be around budding minds. And I just, I love academia. So as such, I have always, whether it was in my undergraduate program at Oberlin, where I earned my bachelor's degree, I took research classes um, at 18, 19, 20, 21. I don't think I was great at research. And I had this notion that was instilled in me from a very young age that I wasn't good at math or science. And for some reason, research seemed to fit in that box of math or science-ish. So I wasn't great at research, but because of what I studied and what I did, I had to get pretty good at it. Um, I also, while I was in college and immediately after college, I worked as a researcher. 
true story. I actually worked as a researcher. Um, without getting too much into the details and the specifics, I will say that I worked as a political campaign researcher, specifically opposition research. And it was out of, it was on the West Coast, which is not a place that I normally live, but for a while I did. It was on the West Coast. Um, it was for a political party and I really, really enjoyed the work. So that was the point where I realized that research wasn't so math and science that I couldn't love it. Well, fast forward, um, while studying at Case Western Reserve University, which is where I attended graduate school, and in case you're just curious, um, I studied adult mental health in the School of so Social Work at Case Western. So at Case Western, as a social work graduate student, one of the things that we had to take, and not just once, there were multiple classes, we had to take research methods. So hence the name of the course, the Reseller Research Methods 101, because in college, when I had to take it, it was research methods because there is a method to it. So let's start with the beginning. What is research? Now, I don't know these things off the top of my head. I have my outline here, and that is why there is a charge for these videos because I have to take notes. I have to have an outline, or I'll just ramble on incessantly and may not even cover the topic that I'm here to cover. So to start, what is research? Research, if you look up the definition, which you can do if you wanna Google it, is the systematic investigation into the study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and new conclusions. Did you catch that? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna say it one more time. Research is the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and new conclusions. There's a lot in that definition. So let's take it a little farther and break down some of these pieces so we can really understand what we're talking about here. Systematic means done or acting according to a fixed plan or system, methodical. So when you do your research, you really wanna have a way that you go about the process. And that's so you're not always recreating the will, exerting extra effort. You, you want to know when you say pick up an item that you go home and you do, but, but, but those are, are your steps, methodical, according to the method. So systematic is an important part of the definition of research. Re research should not be all over the place. You should have a system of sorts. Investigation, one of my favorite words. Honestly, if I could be anything else in life, anything other than what I'm doing, and I love what I'm doing in all aspects, I love my job, I love my business, I, I love what I'm doing, but if I could do anything else, I would be an investigator, specifically forensics. I am addicted to forensic shows. I mean, Forensic Files, I've seen all of those. And a person that I follow on Instagram posted a meme last week about um, searching for an episode of Forensic Files that they haven't seen. And that was really entertaining to me because, yeah, I, there's no episode of Forensic Files that I haven't seen. But even taking it farther than that, um, Investigation Discovery is my joint. My cable provider does not include that in the package that we have here so i don't have investigation discovery but i do have a fire stick that has all the programming a person could ever want and so i watch a lot of the investigation discovery shows that way so all of that is to say investigation my joint i love investigating not to mention if i have a boyfriend that i don't trust my investigative skills are on point on point. Um, investigation means the action of investigating something or someone, formal or systematic examination of research. So, as you'll notice, the action of investigating. I think one of the most frustrating things that people see and deal with or even tolerate in Facebook reselling communities is when whether it's a new person or an older established reseller comes to the group and they post something to say hey what is this what is it worth oftentimes i see those questions get no response whatsoever 
And the reason is because to ask someone, hey, what is this? What is it worth? That gives the impression that you haven't done the action of investigating what you have on your hands. And I can't speak for other people, but I can speak for myself and say that for me, it always feels personally offensive when someone asks you to essentially do their homework. Um, it's very frustrating. It's a very frustrating thing to, to see. If it's a new person that honestly doesn't even know where to start, that's one thing. But I know people that have been reselling longer than me that still pull this kind of stuff where they'll say, hey, I'm at the thrift store. Should I pick these up? Like, don't, don't. Because that tells me that you haven't taken that action of investigating. And in that case, I don't want to help you. It's a totally different story if someone comes into a group and they say, I looked on Google, I checked eBay sold listings, I checked WordPoint, I've checked all these sources, and I can't really figure this out. Can you help me? That's a completely different matter. But if you're going to post a question in a public forum for, for assistance, I suggest that you always start off by at least telling those folks which you've done to try to solve your own problem and solve your own um to answer your own question i run into this problem a lot <clears throat> with jewelry which my friend tanya kind of got me hooked on i'm not an experienced jewelry seller <coughs> excuse me since i'm not an experienced jewelry seller i'll get a jar and I'll have like a stack of things that look interesting or intriguing, maybe worth something that I'll put to the side. But because it's such an unfamiliar subject for me, the research takes forever, forever. It can take me two weeks to do enough research on an item to feel confident that I know what's going on. And even then, there's still sometimes when I realize my research missed something that I should have noted. So yeah, that's important. Materials is another thing that's talked about in the definition and to uh, and study of materials and sources. Materials, in this case, facts, information, or ideas for the use in creating a book or other work. For you, it's gonna be other work. What is your other work? Your other work is your listing, duh. So materials are the facts, information, or ideas that you're going to use to create your listing. Sources means a place, person, or thing from which something comes or can be obtained. As resellers, we use sourcing in, I think, a creative way because everyone talks about sourcing. Got to go sourcing. I'm on a sourcing free. Sourcing, sourcing, sourcing. So I think... As resellers, we have a good comprehension of the word sourcing. But as I said, this means the place, person, or thing from which something comes or can be obtained. For more, most of us, our source is thrift stores, garage sales, yard sales, online. That's where we get our stuff. Fact is a statement that is consistent with reality or can be proven with evidence. Um, fact. This makes me think of when you go out to a yard sale in the summer and you see something that's interesting and you're like, oh, this is cool. How much is it? And the seller will say, oh, it sells for $50 million on eBay. Hmm. I actually had someone, not a reseller, like someone that I know from thrift stores, but not a reseller. I had someone send me a text this week about an item that they bought and they sent me a bunch of eBay listings saying, hey, you know, picked it up for a few bucks is the coolest thing ever. Um, and it sells for this much. So me, because I'm curious and I enjoy the process of research, I decided just to take a look at it. And I responded, which kind of made me sound like rude, probably, that it's a really cool item, but it doesn't sell for that much because if you dig a little deeper, you'll see that none of them have actually sold. None ever have sold. There's a lot of completed listings, but there's no sold listing. So your assertion that it sells for that much is not fact. It's not fact. 
I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, I just gave y'all a definition. Fact is a statement that is consistent with reality or can be proven with evidence. If you can't show me proof that an item actually sold for that price, then I'm really not interested in discussing the item selling for that price because an item is only worth what somebody will pay for it. And conclusion is a judgment or decision reached by reasoning. So in this case, your conclusion is essentially going to amount to your item price after you've done your research. Determining the fair market value of your item is one of the, the first most critical steps to completing a successful sale. Fair market value is actually different than market value. And I think most people know this, but it's not applicable in a lot of different industries. Um, I think the industry where it probably applies the most is going to be real estate because real estate agents would know more than anyone else that market value is one thing, fair market value is something totally different. The term fair market value considers the economic principles of free and open market activity, whereas market value simply refers to the price assigned i.e. mystery item that someone sent me a picture of. They said that it was worth this much because that's what they saw I listed for on eBay. That's the market value. I told them the fair market value is probably significantly less because nobody's paying for it. Hence, it's not worth that amount. It's just not. So to determine the fair market value in that case would be kind of hit or, hit or miss because there's no sales history, but at the same time, for the purposes of our discussion today, it's important that you understand there's a difference between value and fair market value. Research is really important at every step of the sales process, but it's my opinion that is the most important at the point of sale. Sourcing, buying, Acquiring inventory, that's when your research can truly make or break your business. You hear what I'm saying? It can make or break your business. And I know that my mood seemed to change when I said that, but that's because this is really serious. This is like serious to me. And I think it's serious for a lot of people that sell online. I wanna encourage you guys to, to focus on things that you like, enjoy, and can get fired up about. Because it's really easy to get caught up in seeing what other people sell and trying to mimic their results. But in this game, you really, really cannot do that. Because what sells for one person may not sell for someone else. Um, but this is also serious because I've known a lot of people to purchase mass quantities. And when I say mass quantities, I mean mass quantities of stuff. And it's not worth what they paid for it. Like in the end, they may break even. They may break even. I've had this happen. I've had this happen. Um, but the more I do this and the more I know and the more I learn and the more research methods that I employ, the less and less that happens. Rarely do I buy things these days that I can't make a really good profit on. But I've been doing this for five years and I've made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot. However, I think the, the research process is most important when sourcing. If you develop your field research skills, this is going to allow you to source more efficiently. And it's also going to increase your profits while decreasing your death pile. So this, as you can see, is a super, super important topic. It's one that I don't think is talked about quite enough, to be honest, because it is a super, super important topic. Who amongst us doesn't have death piles? Who amongst us hasn't bought something or a bunch of somethings only to realize shortly thereafter that it was not worth what we paid for it? So this is important. Research is also very important in the part of the process where you're assigning a price to an item. You don't want to feel like you're leaving money on the table, but you also don't want to price your items so high that it doesn't sell and it goes still in your store. Right now, I am pulling a lot of items. 
a lot of items. And that's actually one of the things that I've been working on over the past, I'm gonna say a couple of weeks. But I had a hang up because my computer, my computer had an issue. It was down for two weeks, two weeks solid. Um, the Tuesday that I was on the stew, and this was a few weeks back, the Tuesday that I was on a stew, I came up to shoot the show and my computer just would not function. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So I actually, the, the last time, most recent time I was on the reseller stew, I had to be on my phone because my computer wouldn't work. So when my computer was down for two weeks, I couldn't really go through all of the listings that I was pulling and double check those. So I got slowed way down in that process, which I wanted to be done with by the end of the month, but I'm not, I'm not even halfway through it. And I have donated an astronomical amount of stuff, just an incredible amount of stuff, like probably five or six contract bags at this point, And I'm not even halfway through. So you want to be sure that you don't let things just sit in your store for in my case, years, because some of the stuff that I'm pulling and donating, there are things that I bought when I was first starting out based on the advice and content that I consumed. And I thought they were great buys and later realized they weren't great buys. So, you know, I, I never just took the time to put everything else on hold and dig into what these items were. Is it worth my time to continue to list them? If not, dump them and move on. But right now, I'm doing that. And I hope to be done with it by the end of May. But who knows? Who knows? So, we were talking about pricing and why research is important. You don't want to leave money on the table. But you also don't want to price so high that you have these items in your store that go completely stale. This isn't one of those areas, research and pricing, where you can take the advice of others. All like that. Now, sure, you can ask people what they think is worth <clears throat> but I can think of two three maybe even four different instances where someone that I respect trust and someone that I believe in has given me pricing advice and although I took that pricing advice into into consideration Ultimately, my research led me to price the item significantly higher and then the item sold at my higher price. Well, that's because research. That's why. If I am going against a mentor of mine, and these are usually the people that I go to for pricing advice. If I'm going against a mentor and doing something different, that's because I bought the item based on something I discovered in my research and that research leads me to the conclusion I have evidence to believe it's actually worth more. What comes to mind immediately is a bunch of Hilditch and Key pajama sets that I purchased when I was first starting out in my first year. And someone told me to go with $39.99 or $49.99. And my friend Orange B and I, like he did the bulk of the heavy lifting at that time for me on that project because I just, I wasn't, nowhere close to where I am now, but I wasn't where I needed to be to sell the stuff that I had that I had sourced. Like I wasn't experienced enough to get the money that I should have got out of those items. So shout out to my homeboy, my mentor, my friend Ornsby, because he certainly helped me a lot along the way. But if I'm going against a the mentor, then yeah, I, I really believe that it's worth way more. And in the Hill Ditch and Key instance, I think Ornsby suggested 159 or 179. It was something well over $100. And those pajamas sold. They did not take forever to sell. They literally like flew off the shelves. And I priced them at quadruple what a guru was telling me to price them at. So you really want to make sure that even if you ask for pricing advice, you're not considering that to be a Bible. You spent your money sourcing these items so no one, nobody is as invested as you are in getting all the money you can out of those items. So keep that in mind. Another factor that plays a huge part in the pricing decision is how easily can you purchase a similar item? And this is a huge component to the research process. 
So this question, the answer to this question will determine the demand for your item. Demand is, like I said, a super, super key piece of the puzzle. Um, demand has a very significant effect on price. The best way I think to find long-term success on eBay is by selling items that are in short supply, but in high demand. And in whatever niche you may be selling is always, always, always a great idea to do market research. What do I mean by market research? For me, market research is going through every so often and doing research on what items, similar items sell for and what variables make those items more desirable. That's market research. And I really have to get through this and like, quickly. So I want to give you guys a quick example of this. There's a thrift store that I frequent in town. And one thing that they have in abundance is pest dispensers, new sealed pest dispensers. The store has been open for about four and a half years, I would say. And these pest dispensers have been there most of that time. So every so often, I'll take a look and see if there's anything interesting in the pest dispensers. But, um, Market research in that case has compelled me to determine what factors make a pest dispenser more valuable. And the main one, the main one that I've located is if a pest dispenser has no feet. If you don't know what that means, look it up. So the usefulness of market research is often overlooked because if you spend time thinking about your ideal target customer, you can often dig deeper into and join communities where these folks hang out and then you gain your own firsthand knowledge into what they are looking to buy if you know what your customer is looking for it is really really easy to give it to them um an excellent example of this is folks who specialize in men's clothing many clothing sellers for a variety of reasons choose to focus primarily on men's clothing as opposed to all clothing if you think of your target customer for men's clothing, men's high-end clothing, you want to focus on men who know the finer details of those garments, but are also a bit sensitive to price. A bit sensitive. So you really have to get into the mindset of your buyer in order to really, really nail down what they're going to want and how much they're going to be willing to pay for it. You want to avoid the customer that is overly sensitive to price because they usually, people who are shopping for items, they know the value of the item. And if they are suggesting that it's worth way less, then that's not your buyer. So I want to encourage you to never concede greatly on your price if you've done your research. Don't do that because if you've done your research and you have the item listed, with good pictures, an excellent description, all the details, including measurements, and you have it priced where it should be priced, it will sell. It might not sell tomorrow, it might not sell next month, but it will sell because your buyer is gonna come along and they're gonna see that $250 for this suit is a great deal because it's a $2,000 suit. So I just wanna encourage you to think about the person that is a little price sensitive, but avoid the person that is really price sensitive. Um, going back to our example of the men's clothing niche, a place on the web where I hang out because I sell men's clothing and the people who hang out here really, really know men's clothing is askandyaboutclothes.com. Ask Andy, man, those dudes over there are doing it. They, they about that life, they dress in. They, most of them have went to Nordstrom or Neiman Marcus or Saks Fifth Avenue or um, one of the other high-end stores and they've bought a Canali suit. They've actually purchased these in stores. So if they come across your Canali suit on eBay and it's $250, they're going to be okay with that because they've been to Saks and they know it's Saks charges for a Canali suit. But the guys over at Ask Andy, most of them are people who have purchased these fashions at retail and then they wise up a little bit and they start to kind of scour the internet so they can find them at a better price. But they have these really incredibly 
interesting discussions about items. I learned a ton about Brooks Brothers Vintage 3-2 Roll Suits from Ask Andy. A lot of people, a lot of people who sell suits don't know what a 3-2 Roll is. But I do because I hang out in places where the men who buy those suits hang out. So I know a lot more about them than some people would. As such, I've been able to consistently sell 30 plus euro suits for $100, $150, $200. So this is important. Um, this tactic as far as hanging out in places where people who are gonna buy your items hang out is not specific to clothing. It applies to whatever niche that you sell in, but just know that whatever it is you're trying to sell, there's probably a community somewhere if nowhere else on Facebook, devote it to that thing. So find that community, join that community, pay attention, read. Don't ask a ton of questions. Hang in a cut, do your reading, do your research, and you'll learn a lot. Um, selling common items is definitely easier. But selling a one-of-a-kind item is going to prove more profitable in the long run. <laughs> This just reminds me of a comment I saw probably a couple of months ago where someone was complaining that their sales were in the dumpster. And they said, I don't know why my sales are down. I'm selling what everybody else is selling. Really? That's why your sales are down because you're selling what everybody else is selling. But if you're selling what everybody else is selling, it's going to be really, really easy to do the research, know exactly what those items are selling for and keep it pushing. If you're selling a one-of-a-kind item, it's going to take more research. You're going to have to dig into that deeper because you don't have a lot of information to determine what you need in order to build that perfect listing. For most common items, meaning those with sales history, um, the most useful, handy thing that you can do is a basic eBay sold listing search. This is the number one tool that you're gonna use as far as researching items for resale. This is nothing new for people who've been doing this for a while, but I know, I know there's at least one person out there that will probably purchase this video that hasn't been doing it for a while. So you wanna go to eBay and you wanna look at the sold listings. Always and forever, amen. Um, so how do you do that? I'm gonna give you a quick rundown for those who've never done it. If you're using your telephone and you have the eBay app installed, you're gonna go to your eBay app and open that up. And then you're gonna do a general search. Whatever you have, you're gonna do a search and you're gonna pull up the results for that item. Include any keywords that you believe will help buyers find the item. But also, once you get your search results back, you wanna take note of relevant keywords that have helped people sell that item. Because typically, you don't know all the keywords. If you're doing research, that means that you might not know the most about this thing. So you wanna definitely take note of the keywords that people are using that are getting their items out the door. Once you have a list of results, you want to filter on the right-hand side of your app. You want to filter your item. It's gonna be a drop-down menu by sold. You want the sold, switch it over to green. That's all you wanna do, sold. When you do sold, completed, it's gonna switch with it because you can't check sold listings without checking completed listings. That doesn't make any sense. Give me a second, I'm gonna get there. Optional step. This, you don't have to do, this is what I do. You have a number of different ways that you can sort information. You can sort information by the distance it is away from you. You can sort it by price. You can sort it by, um, it, what? I don't know, you can sort by shipping options. There are a lot of different ways that you can sort information once you have your, your search results. What I do, and this is totally optional, is I sort highest to lowest. Most recent, that's another way you can sort, it's most recent. And for some people, that might be the most applicable to what they're trying to sell. But for me, what I do is I hit sold and then I hit highest to lowest. In 75 to 80% of cases, that right there is gonna, <clears throat> It's gonna tell me if I'm gonna pick it up or if I'm gonna pass. 75 to 80% of the time, that one simple search will tell me pick or pass. More often than not, it's pass. <clears throat> um, so checking the item, if you look at what's sold for the absolute most, this, like I said, will often tell you if you need to take any farther steps. 
if I hit sold and search from highest to lowest and the highest thing on that list is $25, mm -mm. pass, keep it moving. What makes this tool most useful, I think, in sorting this way is you need to have in your mind a cutoff point or a bottom line where you do not source items that are beneath that point. For me, that that number has changed greatly over the years. And quite frankly, it shifts. It really shifts. It depends on a number of different things in my business, what that number is. Currently, I am not sourcing items that I cannot sell for at least $40. For a while, it was 50, but then I shifted back down to 40. I'm not sure why, but I did. I shifted back down to 40. So <clears throat> if I sort highest to lowest, and the highest that item has ever went for is $35, I'm passing because once again, that's below my cutoff point. When you're searching the sold listings um, and you sort highest to lowest, it is important to pay attention to the details and the features. Like I said before, if you look at the items that sold for the most, you're gonna notice some things. Like say you take the top five items, those top five items, they're gonna tell you a lot about what buyers of that sort of item are looking for in a similar item so much information but you can't really see that information if you're not looking for it so that's another reason that i'm making this video because there is so much information that's right in front of people but they don't see it this is one of those things when you do your sold item search you want to really 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 pay attention to what sells for the most and then you want to take note of what made it sell for that much um, oftentimes you will hear experienced sellers, more experienced sellers talk about completed listings in contrast to sold listings. And what this means most simply is that items where the listing has ended, but it didn't sell, those are your completed listings. So if I list a pair of pants and I have them on say a 30 day listing and that listing expires, but I relist them, even if I relist them, that's gonna show as a completed listing because it went through the wholesale cycle and it did not sell, but it gives you an idea of the sell through rate. So in contrast to when you do your sell search, you're gonna take note of what's there. When you do your completed search, you're almost, I want to say, taking a step back, if that makes any sense. You're, th you're taking a, a wider view. You're taking a wider view of the market for those type of items. So you're not focused on the highest selling item. You're focused on the, the rate at which the item sells. So once again, it's, that information is right in front of you, but if you don't know to look for it and you don't know it's there, then you might miss it altogether. When you see an item... This is why this is relevant. If you see an item with super, super promising sold listings, but then you check the completed listings and you realize that only 20% of the listed items sold, then that will let you know that the item is relatively long tail. Meaning, typically they have to be listed and relisted and sometimes relisted and relisted before a sale is completed. When you're searching completed listings, you should ask yourself why the items that sold were moved as opposed to the items that went unsold. For me, usually there's a super obvious answer. There's a super, super obvious answer. I can see why the unsold listings didn't sell. It might be crappy pictures, it might be a less than great description, but typically I can tell why the unsold items are still sitting there as opposed to the ones that sold. There will always be a reason people choose to buy one item as opposed to another. And once you nail down that reason, it can help you do the things that have to be done in order to sell your item. So. If you don't find items that are rare or one of a kind, chances are, chances are that you do come across them. Honestly, I'm going to tell you, if you're saying that I don't find great stuff in my area, I promise you it's because you're not looking for the stuff that is great that is in your area. Um, it's not a lack of want typically is a lack of knowledge. Sometimes, rarely, lack of opportunity. Usually it's just a lack of knowledge that causes you to glance right over a valuable item. I've done this with items that have literally been in front of me for months, months, months. I've passed on items that were less than $10 
for three, four, five, six months. And when I bought them, they sold within a week. But I didn't realize that that item was worth that kind of money because I didn't know that that sort of thing sold for that kind of money. And that's one of the things that I focused on really heavily in 2018 that's paying off well for me. I'm really expanding and branching out from what I, I typically sell. And so as such, I'm having to do, like I said, a lot more research, especially with the jewelry. But um, I'm also learning a lot about things that have an incredible demand that I knew nothing about. One thing that I saw recently that I haven't sourced yet, but it, it's at least on my radar, is mechanical keyboards. Like your computer keyboard, this one isn't mechanical. It's like soft key, you can't hear it. But the clickety ones, click, 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 click. Those are worth a ton of money. If you don't believe me, do a search for used mechanical keyboards and you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, if you find yourself finding more and more rare items in your sourcing, it will more than likely be in your best interest to invest in a worth point subscription. That's a worth point subscription. Worth point is a website that scours the entire internet, entire internet in order to find market information, sales information. Industry leading website, I think it's been around for a second. I mean, since I've been a reseller, worth point has always been around, but most people don't wanna pay for a subscription. I cannot tell you off the top of my head how much a subscription is. I know I did try to look it up for this video. It's not readily available. Um, I have a subscription with a group of people. We actually go in and have a group subscription. And that works out really, really well for me because it doesn't cost me a ton, but I still have access when I need it. But WorkPoint provides information from over 350 data sources. 350 data sources and it'll help you with everything art antiques collectibles um it's really most useful with those more rare one-of-a-kind items i would not suggest you run out and get a subscription to worth point if you're selling a ton of clothing because with the vast majority of clothing items there's a ton of sales history and ebay is going to be plenty but if you do find yourself finding those items then worth point is definitely something to think about when the eBay sold listing search fails you and you aren't up to subscribing to WorthPoint, your next best option is Google. Um, one link that I love that I have not dropped on anybody in a long time is let me Google that for you. And I do think, I think I'm going to take like a week in the Resellers Learning Curve Facebook group and everyone who asked the question without posting the research they done, they've done, I think I'm just going to post the let me Google that for you link because it's snarky and sometimes I can be a little bit snarky. But yes, Google. Google is your friend. I Google almost everything that I sell, even clothing. Even though I have plenty of information on eBay to know what I need to know, I still do a Google search on most things. Um... Clothing, using that as, as an example. If you visit the manufacturer website of the brand, it will often tell you a lot of things like maybe the, the age the garment was, the age or the year the garment was produced, design features that made the garment awesome, a detailed item description, if this is a current item, which will contain all the details you could ever want or need. Um, the original manufacturer's suggested retail price, that's important important part of the equation, especially if you have a new tag item, the style name or model name of the garment, etc., etc., etc. So Google is your friend because if you're Googling things, then most often it's going to take you to the manufacturer's website and the manufacturer's website. If you dig around there, you can find even more information, which is going to only help you. It's going to increase your knowledge. It's going to give you information that you can then use in your listing and it's going to help you sell your item because you're just going to have stronger listings you're going to know a lot more about the item and you would have done your soul search so you're going to know right where to price it and boom it's going to fall off the shelves um did you know that ebay has an option that will show you trending items i.e items that buyers are searching for, looking for right now. So if you have not checked that out, I'm gonna encourage you to do so. That is 
where you find that is explore.ebay.com with HTTPS in front of it. Explore.ebay.com. If you guys have never taken a look there, I encourage you to look at it. It's really interesting stuff. Like I said, it tells you what people are looking for, what people are buying on eBay. And if you're a reseller, it's always in your best interest to know what the market is demanding so that you can bring it to them. Um, there is also a what's it worth option within Explore eBay, which can help you nail down some of the finer pricing details. That's not something that I've used, but it is something that I came across as I was preparing for this video. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Sometimes one of the things that I do in my spare time, and I use air quotes because the implication that I have spare time is hilarious. Um, I'll browse local selling sites most often Facebook buy, sell, trade, occasionally Craigslist. And I will look up some of the things that people are asking for large amounts of money for. More often than not, they're not worth what people are asking, but sometimes they're totally worth every penny of what the person is asking. For that reason, um, I always use that as an opportunity because not only do, does it teach me something about a potential item that could be worth great profit but it also teaches me something about the types of things that are in my local area the types of things that I can get my hands on so I encourage you if you find yourself say sitting waiting for a doctor's appointment or just sitting in front of the TV is a commercial break and you pick up your phone and you don't have anything else to do go to your local area wherever you live type in your city and buy sell trade and just scroll through buy, sell, trade and see what people are selling. I have made some incredible flips from things that I found in buy, sell, trade groups. I've made some really solid, amazing flips from things that I've even found on Craigslist. When I was really heavy into my printer hustle, the HP new sealed in the box printer hustle, most of those I found on Craigslist. So that's a, a helpful tip, I think. Um, two things happen if you do this kind of search. It's going to let you know if a seller is way out of line and they're just crazy pants asking for amount of money they're never going to get. And like I said, I do it for educational purposes. You're going to learn something about something you didn't know about before. You're arming yourself with new and useful knowledge and you can't ever have too much knowledge as a reseller. That's the end of my, my outline, thankfully, because I have to get my family up and start getting ready for my son's game. But... Another thing I wanted to just briefly mention is Completely. Completely is an app that you can download on your phone that instead of doing the whole completed eBay listing thing, instead of doing that, you actually, um, it'll tell you the sell through rate. It'll tell you, I think how many items are listed, how many have sold and what the sell through rate is. I have used it, but because I get very in a box, with the way I do things, um, I prefer to just do it the old-fashioned way and to, to do the completed listings on eBay and kind of step back and take this wide picture view, but completely gives you that exact same information, just much quicker. And I know resellers who are wildly successful, definitely more successful than I, if you want to look at success in terms of numbers, which I don't, but I know people who do really, really well selling online and they swear by completely. So I want to encourage you to take a look at that. Just check it out. See if it works for you. If it does, great. If it doesn't, sorry. <laughs> um, on that note, I want to remind you guys that if you have purchased this video, research methods, reseller research methods one-on-one, and you have an item that you would like help with, or you have a question for me, whether it's sort of personal in nature or um, just a generalized question, anyone who purchases this video and can prove to me that you purchased this video, you are free to email me. One question, one question, because I don't know how many people are gonna buy it and I don't wanna be overwhelmed. So for now, we're just gonna say one question. And I assure you that for the cost of you buying this video today, I will respond. And if that involves me getting into the trenches with you, jumping in the trenches and doing the research, I'll do that because you are valuable to me. And I feel like, quite frankly, it's the least I can offer 
because I know there's a lot of things that people might have questions about that I can't possibly cover in an hour video. So if you have any questions and you have purchased this video and can provide proof of purchase, you can email me. My email address is aprilwb7 at gmail.com. April, A-P-R-I-L, W as in wild, B as in boy, the number seven at gmail.com. I will respond to you. Maybe not that day, but within three days, I will respond. On that note, I hope you guys have learned a ton from Reseller Research Methods 101. It's kind of a tongue twister. And if you have any comments, questions, please get those to me. And I hope you guys have a great day, wonderful weekend, and I will definitely talk to you very soon. Later. Bye.